And here we are again with another episode of Really Hard Accounting. Today we tackle preparing the consolidated cash flow statement. Now I'm going to go through an example in just a moment, but let's just get a lay of the land. The consolidated cash flow statement was always the most complicated statement for my team to prepare each quarter. As you can see from the chart here, we had dozens of subsidiaries and joint ventures and equity investments of all classifications. Our financials were rather complex to say the least, and the more gap accounting that gets layered into the financials, the more adjustments that need to get made to the statement of cash flow. Now on the one hand, you could start by combining all of the consolidated cash flow statements from each of the consolidated entities. But you would still need to analyze all the consolidation adjustments again to adjust the combined statement. I think an easier place to begin is to use the consolidated income statement and balance sheet as your starting point. Remember, there are two ways to present the statement of cash flows. The easy way and the hard way. Of course, I'm just kidding. What I meant to say was the direct method, which is the one that shows all of your cash receipts, less your cash outflows, and your indirect method, which is really based on analyzing the changes year over year that occur in the balance sheet. It's this method, the indirect method, that I suggest you use in preparing your consolidated cash flow statement. So your starting place is to calculate and to reconcile the deltas in the balance sheet accounts. And I refer to these as account rolls year over year. So for instance, capital assets is often a tricky account to reconcile because you need to isolate the cash flows from capital expenditures, disposals, as well as to remember to adjust the net earnings for the non-cash items such as depreciation and amortization. In fact, you'll also go through the income statement to identify all of the non-cash source of adjustments that need to be made. This isn't unique to consolidation accounting. What is unique are the items that I have listed here in step two. Purchase price differentials are often included in the consolidated depreciation and amortization numbers but not always. For example, consider the reversal of an inventory fair value increment. That would need to be pulled out and separately adjusted on the cash flow statement. Next, we have dividends from the subsidiary to the parent. These always get eliminated because cash does not leave the bubble. Therefore, there should be no mention of those dividends on the cash flow statement. However, if we do have a non-controlling interest, then we will have a separate line reporting the cash outflow of those dividends because the cash does escape the bubble. Another item which can be confusing is when the parent sells some of its stake in the subsidiary to a non-controlling interest. This is an equity transaction from an accounting standpoint. However, from a cash standpoint, the cash leaves the bubble and thus it must get picked up on the statement of cash flows in the financing section. And lastly, when the consolidated entity enters into a business acquisition, the accounting would dictate that all the identifiable assets and liabilities be separately included in the consolidated statement of financial position. However, for the purposes of the cash flow statement, we typically aggregate the net amount of cash paid and reflect that on one line in the investing section of the cash flow statement. I say the net amount because if cash was acquired as part of the acquisition, this would be netted against the investment. Keep in mind that the company may issue its own shares as consideration for a business combination. In this circumstance, nothing at all would show up in the cash flow statement because no cash has changed hands. Now separately, there would be disclosure of the business combination in the notes to the financial statements that would discuss the acquisition, including the assets and liabilities acquired in the form of consideration paid. So with those points in mind, let's look at an example. Parent Corporation has acquired Emco on January 1st of year two for $114,000. And at the date of acquisition, we have uh, equity value of $90,000 and fair value increments attributable to the patent of $24,000 with the balance being allocated to equipment. Now here we are two years later 
and we've got some statements prepared for us. And here's the detailed consolidated income statement. Consolidated net income of 52220 which was allocated between the parent and the non-controlling as $47,000 and $4,000 respectively. The parent has paid out dividends of $14,400. And when we look at the consolidated balance sheet, we can see the parent corporation has cash, receivables, inventory, land, building and equipment, and intangible assets recorded at the values you see on the screen in front of you, as well as the liabilities, common shares, retained earnings, and non-controlling interest. The consolidation has already been prepared for us. There's some other information that is also provided to us, and that is that Parent Corporation recently issued $80,000 worth of bonds at the year-end date of December 31st. And secondly, that the subsidiary Emco paid dividends of $8,000 during the year. And what is required is to prepare the consolidated statement of cash flow. So how would we go about doing this? To begin with, we'd have to identify any non-cash adjustments that will need to be made to our statement of cash flows. So depreciation would need to be an adjustment, amortization is an adjustment, the loss in the sale of the land is an adjustment, all because these are non-cash charges flowing through the income statement. And next I draw your attention to the balance sheet where we are really looking at identifying and reconciling the deltas between the year 4 and the year 3 balance. We know at the end of the day that we're trying to explain a change in cash flow of a positive $68,800. A starting place would be to simply calculate the differences year over year. Our differences from a cash flow perspective when you're looking at assets is that when these assets actually go down it's actually a good thing from a cash flow perspective as it's a relief of investment in working capital or capital assets. So for instance because receivables have gone down by eleven thousand dollars in year four this would represent a relief of working capital of $11,000 representing a positive cash flow to the consolidated entity. The opposite is true for the liabilities. When liabilities go up, as they have in the case of payables and accrued liabilities, this represents a source of financing. And so the $3,400 would represent a cash inflow, and so on and so forth. The next step is to prepare a cash flow reconciliation. In other words, analyze our roles of the accounts year over year. The first one is to look at any business acquisitions. Now in our example, Emco was acquired in year two. That does not impact our current year's cash flow. Next, we'll look at depreciation and amortization. And from our analysis of the balance sheet, we're able to identify the amount of depreciation taken on the building and equipment. And that amount was $37,000 and the amount of amortization for the patents was 2400 The next three columns cover off our capital expenditures, or in other words capex, any proceeds we had from disposition of capital assets, as well as adjusting for any loss or gain report in the financial statements. Now we know from our financial statement analysis of the consolidated income statement that there was a loss of two thousand dollars on the sale of some land. Now in the case of the uh, loss on the on the land we know we're trying to account for a twenty eight thousand dollar change in the land two thousand dollars will get added back to the operating cash flow section as a loss in the sale of the land which means that the remaining twenty six thousand dollars must represent the proceeds on disposal of that land we can also use the same logic when we're looking at the building of equipment assuming that there was no information to suggest that we sold any capital assets that means that this $88,000 uh, of unreconciled difference must represent the cash outflow spent on new equipment and buildings. Next we have our working capital adjustments and these are fairly straightforward. We know that our change in receivables would be this amount and our change in inventory would be a cash outflow of $40,000 and our change in payables and accruals would be a positive $3,400. Our next column picks up the issuance of debt, the $80 million that was issued at year end. The next column I have here is for the repayment of debt. 
Now, there does not appear to be any uh, information with respect to repayment of debt, so we just leave that blank. Our next column is to pick up the amount of the dividend paid by the parent, and we can remember that from our retained earnings statement. And that would be, again, a negative cash flow. So we'll just add that here and tie it into the amount on the retained earnings statement of 14400 Next, we pick up the consolidated net income, both the portion attributable to the parent as well as the portion attributable to the non-controlling interest. And then finally, we have to pick up the amount of dividend that was paid by the subsidiary to the non-controlling interest, i.e. the amount of dividend that left the bubble. That amount would equal our $8,000 times the 20% interest. And again, this would be a negative outflow which leaves us, with, leaves us with just one unreconciled amount of $1,200. And that pertains to a bond premium. Now, if you think of how the bond premium expense uh, works, it would be amortized against interest expense. And we didn't separately identify this when we were looking at the income statement. The journal entry to record this would be to debit the bond premium account uh, for $1,200 and to credit interest expense for $1,200. So in fact, our interest expense would be $1,200 higher than what is reported on the income statement to reflect the amortization of this bond premium account. And we'll just include this in the depreciation and amortization column. And it's a negative cash outflow because interest paid was in fact $1,200 higher than was reported on the consolidated income statement. We now have enough information to prepare our cash flow statement. So what we're going to do now is to transfer those amounts from our reconciliation to our cash flow statement, which I've already set up here. Our net income amount, well, we can pull that from our consolidated uh, statement of income. Next, we have our depreciation and amortization of the $37,000 and the $2,400. Our loss on the land of $2,000. Our amortization of the bond premium of $1,200. And then our change in working capital relating to receivables which was $11,000, our inventory, which was $40,000, our payables, which was $3,400, our proceeds on the land disposal, which were $26,000, our capital expenditures, which we determined to be $88,000, the issuance of the bond, which was $80,000, that would be a positive cash flow, our dividends from the parent, $14,400, and our dividends to the non-controlling interest of $1,600. And now you can see that our cash flow is complete. Our change in cash flow equals the $68,800 that we were looking for in the beginning. And our beginning balance of $49,000 translates to our ending balance of $118,600. So there you have it. So that is how you prepare a consolidated cash flow statement. The only thing that we did not see in this example was what would happen to the cash flow statement had we acquired a business. And we would be required to adjust each of the working capital amounts and the capital expenditures for any new assets that pertain to the business acquisition as these would get all reported in a single line included in the investment section. So hopefully this demonstration of the indirect method and the use of the uh, account rules will help you in preparing your cash flow statement. A lot of the principles that you would have learned in your intermediate accounting course are still relevant in a consolidated cash flow statement context. That's all for this lesson, so until next time, don't stop to get to the top. When you get to the top, don't stop.